All right. Well, hey, everybody. Thanks for uh, joining us today for a little bit of the show. Uh, today we have a special guest with us. We're going to have Zach. Hey, Zach. What's up? Hey, how's it going? Zach. Nah, no problem. Thanks. Um, our topic today is data driven insights within point analytics. So you were the first person I thought of to have on the show. So appreciate you joining. Uh, watching me and Steve pretty much embarrass ourselves on live TV or internet nowadays. <laughs> hey, I'm right there with you. Happy to happy to be the, the third person embarrassing themselves. <laughs> All right, so just a quick intro for those that haven't uh, seen the show before. Uh, my name is Danny Guillory. I'm a senior program manager on the Configman team, and I'm responsible for all cloud attach. Steve? I'm Steve Thomas. I am on the customer. <laughs> and all right, he'll be back. <laughs> all right, Zach. All I'll right. Uh, Zach Dvorak, program manager on our Microsoft Endpoint Manager team, uh, specifically focusing on endpoint analytics. All right, thanks. Yeah. Um, so, you no know, intros are done. Steve will be back in a second once he realizes he lost connection or something. So, Zach. Tell me a little bit about, um, you know, this overview pane when it comes to analytics. What am I looking at here? How does how does one decipher this information? Yeah, you know, it's a good question. I, I think the the best place to start is, you know, let's let's talk a little bit about why we build endpoint analytics in the first place, right? And really, I think the what we started here and in this, you know, we we obviously meet with customers regularly and we have forums like. Back in the day, we used to have the in-person conferences like Ignite. We've got all of our online forums now. And what, one of the things that common theme we kept hearing for the last several years is, you know, a lot of IT departments were starting to take a close look at the end user experience within their organizations. And it's, it's one of those things where, you know, historically it's always played second fiddle to things like security or compliance and, you know, making sure that the devices are protected, corporate information is secure. And what we found is that throughout the years, as companies start to tack on more and more of these, you know, sort of required configurations, software, uh, you know, just different items, whether it be a security application, whether it be, you know, some sort of identity VPN, as you add more and more to these devices, you're, you're degrading the end user experience and in many cases, it had gotten to the point where end users were frustrated, their devices were almost unworkable. And so that's sort of why we we created the endpoint analytics solution was with an eye toward the end user experience, really to help give IT pros sort of a sense of whether they are helping their end users be productive or perhaps getting in the way. And so when we look at the overview page here, we're really looking across all of the different areas that um, endpoint analytics considers. So currently that's going to be startup performance, our recommended software, and then application reliability, which is in preview. And of course, over there on the right hand side, you'll see the insights and recommendations. And this is really meant to be sort of a prioritized list of best actions that IT pros can take in order to improve the end user experience all up. Awesome. Yeah, one of the things I really love about this overall screen is how I get the recommendations, how I get baselines. Uh, the baselines are super impactful just from a perspective. I remember having, oh God, change management conversations and things like that, and people poking holes through the various um, methodologies that we use to write, come up with data. But it was so impactful to be able to get a snapshot of what my um, analytic experience looked like before and after, right? So if I patch it on patch Tuesday, hey, I can go and say after patch Tuesday or seven days after say, hey, here's the impact of that patching to our environment. So baselines are hugely, hugely impactful like, to some of the customers I work with and would be hugely impactful to me if I was back then on the other side again. Absolutely. I think the, you know, one of the great things about the baseline concept, right, is, you know, we, we often hear this sentiment that, you know, IT doesn't necessarily feel like they have a sense 
uh, whether what they're doing is helping, right? We need to know if if the actions that we're taking and all of the things that we're doing are getting in the way or they're actually moving the needle forward. And there are certain things where, you know, certain taxes we have to pay, right? Security is always going to, to be paramount to organizations, right? So we might have to install a new security application on devices, and that may come with the user experience hit. But when we look at the baseline concept, we can start to quantify exactly what that impact is. And then we can look for areas where we can sort of reclaim that end user experience hit from that required application. So I totally agree with you. I think the baselines really put everything into context and really help you quantify what it is that you're doing on devices. Right. One one of the mysterious things here, I'll tell you, I got a lot of questions about now. I'll, I'll, I want to hear it from your mouth, right? Because I have my way of telling it, but what's this little carrot here? So the little gray carrot right there in the middle, middle where baseline 50. Yeah, explain that to me, you know, out of your words. Yeah, so the, the little carrot there is is basically just the marker for the baseline that you have selected. So right now, if you, if you look up into the top right there, your, your baseline that you have selected is that all organizations median. And so over on the on the score just below where you have the the green bar we've got the endpoint analytics score for your tenant which is a 72 and then we have the baseline with a 50. and so that little the gray carrot is supposed to be the visual representation of that 50 baseline now if we were to select a different baseline looks like you had several in there so let's just go ahead and grab one i want to pick this one because i knew it was bad <laughs> well there you go so notice that the, the little gray carrot is going to slide up to about an 85 because in your baseline that you selected, that VIP baseline, the baseline score value here was an 85. Now notice a couple other things that changed on the screen when we did that. The bar went red, so our, our score is now red instead of green, and that's because we uh, this particular score today, the 72, represents a regression from that baseline of 85. And then you'll also notice right above the score bar, we have that little icon that popped up that says needs attention. If your score regresses far enough, I believe it's over 10%, then we'll put that needs attention banner up there to basically alert you to the fact that your endpoint analytics score all up has regressed more than 10% from the time that you took this baseline that you have selected. Gotcha, gotcha. That's really good feedback. And this is kind of the one thing I like to show customers. Like this is that before and after picture, right? We before, I would say, I'll probably do a snapshot before a lot of things in my environment, right? Before patching, before installing agents, before making group policy changes or, or other cloud policy changes, but ideally driving with data, right? Kind of the topic of, of the whole episode, right? Data-driven decisions, right? Not just putting your finger in the wind, figuring out which way things are blowing, right? So super impactful um, and, and just sharing another story like one of my customers, I remember startup score was one of the first things you guys came out with with endpoint analytics and it was super exciting with one particular customer because what we realized is for a whole hour, people would do nothing. They would take their laptop or, or, or device out of their bag. They would press power. They go get coffee, walk around, socialize, talk about movies, TV shows, go to the store, come back, and then log in, only to wait another thirty minutes. So, um, you know, a lot of customers when I was talking to them about analytics when we first started, it was, hey, it's it's you don't you guys don't have a lot there yet, but what we have is super valuable, right? And um, helping them understand that vision, understand the things that we are in intending to drive with that analytics, I mean, has been mind blowing. And again, still super jealous of customers because when I was an IT director, I didn't have this. It was Excel <laughs> spreadsheets. Hey, how do you feel today? How's your computer working? Ah, oh, man, it was rough times. So um, and, it was. And, and that, that's exactly right. You know, if, if there's, you know, if, there, if there's one key takeaway for, for endpoint analytics that I like to hammer, it's it's the the goal here is really just to help you quantify things, right? And and to your point, I the the actual reason we went after startup performance first, right? It, it sounds like a simple scenario, but we were at a conference a couple of years back, and and we had an IT pro come up to us and ask if we had any sort of tool to assist with startup performance on devices and you know we like well no it's not really something we've considered and internally at microsoft we we don't necessarily deal with a startup performance problem right i'm accustomed to my device booting quickly i can log in quickly so it didn't really resonate with me initially well then he told me a story kind of what you were describing danny where 
his users would come into the office in the morning and they all had desktops, so they were sitting at their desk, type in their password, and then they'd go make a cup of coffee, wander around the office. So it would take five or 10 minutes for that device to log in. And the, this IT pro was particularly concerned about this, not from an end user experience perspective, but from a security perspective, because all of a sudden we have users who have authenticated their, you know, typed in their password, pressed log in, and then left their desk for an undetermined amount of time waiting for that device to log in. And so it's, it, it really is one of those scenarios where, you know, I sure hope that for, for most IT pros, it doesn't resonate with you because it's not a problem. <laughs> but endpoint analytics can definitely, you know, help you quantify and determine is this something that we might need to drill into, and if so, what can we do to improve the situation? Yeah, yeah. So um, I, I just, you know, realized I didn't click in the startup score, so I clicked in. And um, one of the things I'll tell you is super impactful. Like um, another customer I talked to back when we were going to the office as an EDC, <laughs> um, I talked to a customer that was doing through PC re refresh, right? And as they were going through their PC refresh, what they're doing was, um, I asked the guy, I was like, hey, how are you doing your PC refresh? What's your methodology? How are you going through that? And the one thing he said was, I'm just looking at an Excel spreadsheet, checking out the old stuff, and then um, whatever's the older stuff, I will, you know, prioritize that first. So as I got to, you know, have more deeper dialogue with him, this really came up and it really resonated because as I came, as I had my thought process, I was telling him, hey, what if you did that PC replacement based off of the worst performing devices, right? So when I thought of the analytics, it was like, great, let's go look at model performance, right? If you look at model performance, you can see the worst performing devices. And it may not be that they're the model is performing badly. It could just be a misconfiguration, but that's the analytics tells you the right place to go dig instead of, oh, what's happening in help desk this week, last week? You know, <laughs> how do you feel today? Did you have a good drive to the office today, right? It, it's a whole bunch of driving by data instead of just, you know, random data points. It, it's such a good point. And I think the, you know, one of the things that's, that's a little surprising or it's interesting that we've learned with input analytics, right, is different devices, different models will behave differently in different environments. Right, so so based on the configurations you use, the software that your end users are using, the different policies and settings that you have applied, different models are going to behave differently. And so, you know, one of the things that you'll see more and more of in endpoint analytics is sort of this focus on device-centric performance metrics. So right now we've got you know startup performance, application reliability, but you'll see us more and more start to look at all of these things across a particular device or type of devices to help you make exactly those decisions you just called out, Danny, right? I'm, I'm going to replace some devices. Which one should I replace them with? That sort of thing. Right. Steve, uh, glad to have you back. I guess you had some <laughs> technical difficulties. Glad to have you back. Um, tell us about, you know, I know you talk to, still talk to a lot of customers, um, as well as you're a soundboard for a lot of peers. So what are you hearing from your customers related to startup score, startup performance, and um, the, the whole, just that piece of the analytics puzzle? Well, um, it's funny because someone just asked a, a question in chat that's very similar to some of the questions I'm getting from customers like when will endpoint analytics start to point to the specific GPOs that may be slowing down the startup performance? Yeah, so um, trying not to segue too much, but check out the first episode where we talked about group policy transformation. We had, uh, we talked about group policy analytics and things you can do there. Um, as far as endpoint analytics, Zach, I mean, you got anything to add about that type of data? I don't know. Get... Yeah, it's, you know, you know, it's a question that we get quite a bit and not to sound harsh, but the, you know, the, the answer that I would give is probably never, right? Because it's, it, it's a bit off message for us to get to the level of specific GPOs that are causing issues, right? Mm. If, if you're serious about improving startup performance by tackling GPOs, I'll go back to Danny's point, right? We, we have group policy analytics, we have tools that can help you migrate to the modern methods for device policies and compliance. But starting to cherry pick specific group policies and removing this, removing that, 
you're, you're really just, it's more of a Band-Aid solution than an actual fix to the problem. Right. Yeah, I think, you know, and I'm, I don't want to dig too much into the one specific question, but just like top of mind, right? And then we'll, we'll move on because there's other things obviously we want to talk about. The top of mind, like if you're concerned about group policies being that impact for you, let me switch back to the demo right quick. When you look at the startup performance, you can actually see here if group policy is one of those things that is slowing your um, uh, performance down, your startup performance down. So now I would look at the different signals that you can put together, right? When it comes to, hey, I think your policy is slowing me down. Hey, here's the data to go prove it. Now, once you prove it or disprove it, then you can go to the other analytical solution, the policy analytics, to kind of see what that impact is. Maybe I have some misconfiguration, log on, log off, log off scripts, then the device is not even there, so it's waiting on the timeout. You know, putting the different signals together helps you figure out how you want to tackle it. So hopefully that answers the question or gives you a beginning of a methodology to, to get to, hey, how do I solve the problem? And, and that's a good point so, too, right? I, I think the, the there's also a lot to be said about the fact that, you know, let, let's let's drill in and make sure this is a problem before before we go right. to solve it, right? I see another question here Absolutely. in the chat window where, you know, if, if, we're, if we already are using AAD policies or, or we're using modern desktops and we don't necessarily have group policy objects in place, then, you know, the the time that you see in endpoint analytics is really just telling you how long is the device spending evaluating group policies? Oh, there are none moving on, right? So so it might, right. might have one or two seconds showing there, but, it, you know, if it's not a problem that's worth going after, then at least you have that information in endpoint analytics so that you can know where you focus your time. Right, right. All right, um, I can waddle in this mud forever, but I, I want to get to some of the other parts of uh, the analytics that is super important and super uh, valuable to our customers. So um, another thing I love to talk about is uh, proactive remediations. I absolutely love proactive remediations because you know what it makes me think of? It makes me think of the old school Microsoft Help It tool, um, Fix It tool. Um, man, all types of automations that I did from configuration items with remediation, automatic remediation, but now that's just reborn, rebirthed into the cloud. So I really love it um, in a sense, right in my lab here. Switch to the demo right quick. See, I don't have anything, so I'm gonna jump to the PowerPoint so I can actually show you some screenshots of some of the things that we had uh, on the screen. So Zach, a uh, good screenshot of some things that I found from one of our other tenants, that test tenants at least. Give me kind of a breakdown of what I'm looking at here. Like, what are these different columns? Give me a breakdown. Yeah, so, I mean, like I said, proactive remediations is just a, a super powerful um, sort of framework is the way I like to think about it, right? The we got the handful of scripts that are going to be built into the tool, but you, as you can tell in this screenshot here, this looks like a tenant where the IT pro has actually gone in and started authoring a whole bunch of custom scripts as well. And so, you know, it looks like, I mean, we've got at least a dozen scripts in here in various states. Some of them have been deployed. Some of them are not currently being deployed. Others are active. And, and basically what we're seeing as we go across this table here is these scripts they they can be configured in different ways if you drill in you can understand how they're being deployed but basically we've got two phases for each of these scripts there's a detection phase and a remediation phase that detection phase is going to be part one which is going to run on devices and attempt to determine if the device is in some sort of a known unhealthy state and so that, those are those first two columns with numbers there the without issues and with issues so when we run that detection script how many devices came back and said, nope, no problem? How many devices came back and said, yep, th this issue is present on the device? And then if the IT Pro has configured the second part of the script, which is that remediation part, it will automatically run and attempt to kick the device out of that known unhealthy state, so basically to remediate. That's where those other columns come in. So we'll show you how many devices uh, the issue got fixed on, so the remediation was successful. How many devices we were able to fix the issue, but then it ended up recurring. And then also the, the total number of remediated devices overall. And so this is these are just sort of ways to track the success of, of these scripts here. It looks like um, if I go down to that third row from the bottom, it looks like that's a good example of a script that was very successful. And we see 81 issues were fixed and only 14 recurred. If I go a little higher up, about five or six down, 
I see sort of the opposite, right? Here's a script where we had 23 issues fixed, but it recurred over 200 times. So maybe there's something we can do differently in terms of that script, or maybe we need a stronger fix. And so it's really just that feedback loop to make sure that these scripts are doing what we expect them to do. And of course, fully customizable. So, you know, the IT pro can go in and continue to make edits and adjustments to make sure these scripts are having the, the impact that they expect. Right. Steve, um, what, what have you heard from your customers working with your customers and with other peers that talk to you about this product and remediations piece? They want more of them. <laughs> they, they love the built-in offerings and they want dozens more. In fact, we've got some questions about that in the chat as well. You know, when are we going to include more built-in ones? Right. It, it's a good question. Zach, I'll let you uh, have it there first. I, I have my opinion, but go. you go first. I, I, Danny, I have a feeling we have the same opinion here. Um, so uh, it, it's a good question. And it's it's one of those things where if I talk to 100 different customers, I'll get 200 different answers about what kind of scripts they yeah. want. Right. And and so it's there's there's, you know, sort of diminishing marginal utility in terms of the value to each customer for scripts that we publish. It's important to remember that proactive remediation is a framework. Right. And so what we don't want to do is clutter your tool full of hundreds of scripts that may or may not apply to you. So one thing that you'll see in the future is we're, we're working on making it easier for you to uh, pull scripts that are authored by community members. So other IT pros, um, even ISVs, IHVs, OEMs, people can write scripts for their software, for problems that they face and then share those out with the community and you'll be able to pull from those and, and use them in your environment. We're already seeing a whole bunch of MVPs and, and other IT pros uh, publish proactive remediations that they've written in their own personal blogs, for instance. We wanna make that process a little more formal for you. Um, and I think that's gonna be what you see us doing moving forward, because at the end of the day, it's, it's very challenging for us to write scripts that are gonna apply broadly to everyone but you know there, there are there's certainly a lot to be said about pulling from you know sort of a, a community resource instead of having you know a hundred different companies write the exact same script over and over again yeah yeah totally agree i mean you hit all the same points i was thinking of i guess you know from you know when i was a customer i used to ask microsoft for a bunch of stuff and as well as all our customers do i guess this thinking who knows my business business better, right? Microsoft or me. So maybe Microsoft provides some frameworks, some recommendations, but what I really want Microsoft to provide detection and remediation for my environment. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> no. I mean, that, that's a double-edged sword either way, right? Yeah, and it's, it, and it's you know, just to kind of close the loop on that point, I think, you know, if, if, especially when we're talking about third-party applications or device oh, driver yeah. issues, right? The ISV, the OEM, they're going to know their system a lot better than we are, right? Yeah. So if, if, if they can be the ones to write that script and then you can pull it on demand as you need it, that's what I see as the right framework there. Yes, absolutely. Um, let's see. Um, you had a great articulation I heard about uh, a customer you had talked to that used, I want to say, proactive remediation for some notifications. Did, what was that story about? Like, can you share a little bit about that? I thought that was super unique. I, I would have never thought about that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's you know, it kind of goes back to the point that proactive remediations is a framework and, and you can do a lot of cool stuff with it, right? When we built it, we, you know, we had a certain sort of, you know, narrow idea in mind about what it was going to be used for. And a whole bunch of IT pros have sort of blown our minds in terms of what they've done with it. <laughs> and I think the, you know, the, the story I think you're talking about, right, is we, we had a, um, a customer that, that sent us a script that they had written where um, they, they were basically using the built-in Windows uh, Toast notification feature to pop up a little notification to users if there was a certain situations on the device where they needed that user to contact the help desk either to you know file a warranty claim or to replace some sort of component in that device or even simple things right like you know they 
one one IT pro used it to notify users that hey we got a really important security patch and we really need you to restart your device could you please do it right we don't want to force it on you and so it's right. it's one of those things where the scripts are PowerShell scripts right and and you can do a lot of cool things with PowerShell and so you know we've we've seen a lot of IT pros get creative with it and like I said the you know a lot of them will, will freely publish the scripts that they write on their blogs or or you know elsewhere online so. It's been really cool to see kind of how IT pros have taken the feature and run with it. Right. Yeah, no, I think it's super interesting on, on the things that as we develop them, what the community turns out to do with them. Uh, it opens our eyes in various different ways, right? Um, all right, so talk to me a little bit about application health. Like you, you've been, you birthed this great tool. Um, I love it. I know the customers I work with love it. Tell us a little about about app health. What do you, what have you, what's some feedback you're hearing so far, and where do you think this is going to go? Alrighty, yeah, application reliability. This is a big one. Um, this is a this is a feature that is you know still very much in its infancy. We we released the public preview, I believe, about a month ago in early March. Um, so you know we're we're starting to get a lot of good feedback, um, you know, from what customers are seeing in this feature here. The the goal with this is we're trying to shine a light on uh we use the term reliability we're basically looking at crash and hang events so we're looking at objective metrics of application issues uh, related to desktop applications now you heard me use the term objective issues there when we think about where we want to take this this feature in the future i see a couple questions in the chat window about this as well you know, we also want to start to incorporate some of the more subjective issues with applications, right? So, so right now we've, we've got you covered when, you know, user calls into the help desk and says, hey, Outlook keeps crashing, right? What we don't yet have visibility into is when users call in and make reports like, hey, my computer's running really slow whenever I launch Chrome or, you know, whenever I'm browsing the internet, it just, the pages never load. Right, those more subjective issues, um, you know, that, that's something that we're working on shining a greater light on where we'll be pulling some resource performance data, looking at things like CPU memory spikes and trying to correlate those with negative uh, end user experiences as well. Some of the well, other things that we're so going to have. Oh, go ahead, Danny. Nah, I was just going into the next uh, next slide where I had some data where we can see the different applications. You want to give me a little bit of breakdown here? Yep, you're one step ahead of me. That's right where I was going to send you. <laughs> so the as as we drill into the feature today, what we have is, you know, at, at an executable level, all of the applications that we're seeing in your organization. Now we're focused on foreground applications with usage, right? So these are going to be the apps that are crashing right in front of the end user space. We, we're really looking at, you know, which applications are having the greatest impact on the end user experience and their productivity. And so we're going to show you across your application estate, total number of active devices. We always look at a 14 day window. So we'll look at the total number of devices that have at least launched that app. We have the, the total usage duration across all of the devices in your estate. And then things like the number of crashes, what we call the mean time to failure, which is sort of our way of normalizing the, the crash rate across different applications. So that allows for more apples to apples comparisons. And then we will also give you an app reliability score, which is basically going to be related to both how frequently that app crashes as well as how much it's used. So in other words, applications that are heavily used and crashing frequently are going to have the lowest scores because they're the ones having the greatest impact on your end user's experience. And then vice versa, applications that are heavily used but very stable, those will have the highest scores. Great. Steve, what? How much have you been doing with this uh, app health so far? Like, what are you hearing from peers and customers? Well, it's funny because one of the first questions I always get is, how much do I have to bump up the telemetry requirements in my organization? So uh, how about that, Zach? What are the telemetry requirements for yeah, app, it, app health and endpoint analytics? It's a good question, and it's a question we get quite a bit. Um, and and it's you know it's an interesting assumption that you know the the telemetry is required because the I mean the the short answer is no no telemetry is required for anything that you see in endpoint analytics. So the the data is all going to be collected through your management tool. And so when we when we have configuration manager, we're using that computer agent that's already on the box. When we have Intune, we're using the management extension to collect this data. So no telemetry required there. You can have it 
all the way down completely off and you'll still be able to get all the all the insights that you see in endpoint analytics awesome all right I, there's so much more i want to get into but i don't want to consume everybody's day i'm sure everybody has other things to do besides sitting here and listen to us ramble about <laughs> analytics um i do want to get to some q a but i want to spend you know two minutes five minutes talking about the other cool thing the latest thing that i've um seen you guys put out yeah performance this is super exciting for customers um so i don't want to steal any thunder zach have at it go for it no this is a good one and this is um this is a great example of where you know one one of the things that that we work really hard to do on the team here is to make sure that um you know we are delivering features that are you know sort of complete and holistic i, I think the analogy that you know we like to use on the team is the whole henry ford back in the day his faster horse analogy right where a lot of times when we talk directly to customers they they'll ask for a faster horse right and we really want to kind of take what they're saying and turn that into how okay how do we build them a car right and so this was born out of countless requests for uh, more blue screen information. And what we realized as we started to do research on blue screens is that, you know, while blue screens are, are you know, a very visible problem for a lot of companies, it's actually disruptive to end users anytime a device restarts, right? And so we, we wanted to give a complete picture of how frequently devices are restarting and what's causing those restarts. So you'll notice here we break restarts into six categories and roughly speaking there's there's the unexpected ones at the top there's the expected ones in the middle and then unknown at the bottom so when i say unexpected restarts those are going to be things like the blue screens as well as equally important is what we call a long power button press and this often gets ignored by it because it doesn't uh, manifest itself as as easily but this is where an end user their device might get frozen or locked up they get frustrated and they just hold down that power button until the device restarts. That is also an unexpected disruptive restart, right? If the user has resorted to holding down that power button, there was probably a major issue with that device. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. did that this morning. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. And I'm sure you didn't just do it for fun, did you? No, I didn't, I didn't. Ah, cool. Um, so course, give me a little bit about this chart down here. What, I, I just recently chart? had to do that. Uh, like like <laughs> ten minutes ago. Uh, I guess so, huh, Steve. <laughs> and so the um, so this Zach, chart down. Tell us a little about this chart down. Here. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So so this chart down here, we're looking at two things. So we have the blue line at the top, which showing me the percent of devices that have restarted over the past thirty days. And so this chart is interesting because it's going to show us spikes in. Uh, restarts for our devices and so we'll we'll be looking like if, if you notice here in the middle of that chart there toward the end of March it looks like we dipped down to about 50 percent and then since then we've climbed back up which you know typically we would expect this number to be close to 100 percent because we're rolling out a monthly security patch right and if if this number dips too low like it did toward the end of March there then that might be cause for concern because that means 50 percent of our devices haven't restarted in the past month and so they're, they may be behind on their patching. They may not have the latest fixes applied. Now, the, the orange line at the bottom, this one's also going to be super critical because this is looking at the average number of restarts per device. And so what, what we often hear from you know, customers is we've seen a huge uptick in blue screens lately, or we, we've seen a huge uptick in customers reporting you know, devices freezing up, they have to restart. This is a great way to start to sort of stay out in front of those trends. And if you start to see this value creeping up, then we can go up a little higher on the page and drill in and see, all right, why are these devices restarting? Where are we seeing uh, an increase? And, and we can drill in from there. Gotcha. Now, one of the things I, I do want to call out, because I see a question over here uh, in the chat, and I also get this question quite a bit. Um, I get the question of, all right, if we go back to the top of this page, and it tells me that we have, you know, X number of devices with blue screen. So it looks like we have a third of our devices have a blue screen and our average is one per device. Well, how do we know which devices those are or which devices have that blue screen? And it's actually in here already. So one of the things we'll, we'll take that feedback and we'll make it a little more uh, discoverable because we, we do get the question quite a bit. But if you click over to that device performance tab up at the top, 
and there we go, yep. You'll notice we've added a column over there on the far right for the number of blue screens in the last 30 days. So you can actually sort that, and it looks like in this case, we've got one machine that's had two blue screens. And if I click in and scroll down, I'm able to see on a restart by restart basis what's causing these problems. And so in this case, it looks like we've had three in the past month or so, two of those in the last 14 days, and we can see the stop code as well as a failure bucket ID when it's available. So in this particular device's case, we've had three blue screens across about a week, the 23rd through the 28th, and they all had a different stop code. So that's interesting. So it's not the same problem that just keeps recurring on this device. And, and we can, you know, click in to drill and see exactly what, um, you know, if there's any more information available about what these particular stop codes are. That is just going to take you to the bug check page. So just to, you know, kind of get you started on troubleshooting so you can understand how that stop code maps to a particular issue. Yep, that, that's super interesting. I, I guess the thing I would, I, I want to make sure our audience takes away is that analytics is going to really help you understand insights in your environment. I, I'm sure you say, you know, all three of us may say it a different way, but when I'm talking to customers, even if they don't want to use Endpoint Manager, I implore them to turn on analytics, especially, Steve, you notice just like I do, you know, you being on the cat team, most customers have the solution, just don't even use it. But once they enable it, having the insights into your environment is super um, important, valuable, powerful, um, helping drive change in your environment. Um, I, the analytics I take like as this, um, when I was in the military, they have the see something, do something. Well, this is kind of the same thing, right? It's like, hey, I see something. Um, I can't act like I don't see it now. Now, hopefully you choose to resolve those things when it, with, you know, endpoint manager. But, you know, if you at least turn on the analytics, you can get super powerful insights about your environment and various different pieces, connecting dots like we talked about earlier with, hey, analytics shows me group policy. Which policy? Well, go look at the other signals that we have across the cloud estate. So super powerful, super impactful. I love when customers light up and connect those dots like that. Yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, I, I think I'll, I'll echo that point, you know, where if nothing else, you enable endpoint analytics, you will learn something, right? And, <laughs> absolutely. and the, it's, it's so fun for me just to see you know, a lot of IT pros have long-standing assumptions being challenged when they're finally able to see the data, right? I, I think a lot of a lot of companies just assume, well, startup performance isn't a problem for us because you know nobody calls in the help desk about it, right? Like, right. My, my device boots fine, so we we, we don't worry about that, right? <laughs> I, analytics is a great way to sort of challenge those assumptions, and you know what? If you're right, great. Now you have the data to prove it, but if Absolutely. not. Now you know where your opportunities are. Steve, what's um what's been top of mind for your customers with analytics when they ask you about analytics? Besides privacy, where's my data? I'm sure everybody asked that at some point and they go off the cliff on it. But besides that, like what's the super what's the super exciting thing for your customers? Well, we're we're getting some questions related to scope tags in the chat. And and great, let's hit So scope tags is a big ask from customers, uh, mainly for um, bet more granular visibility. Uh, another ask is for customers who like to build their own dashboards. And again, we had a question in the chat about that. What about uh, leveraging this stuff via log analytics for customers who want to build their own custom dashboards? Yeah, they're good questions, and and so the. You know, the, the short answer is that today we have uh, uh, pretty much all the data in endpoint analytics is publicly accessible via the, via the graph APIs. So you can you can query graph APIs to pull your data out of endpoint analytics. We've also obviously got export buttons all throughout the tool. So if you're if you're looking at a particular table and you, and you want to play around with that data in Excel or in a different format, you can just click that export button. Um, the log analytics question specifically is a good one, right? Because I think that sort of enables uh, more streaming data, right? So instead of querying an API on demand, you're, you know, you, you have the data flowing in, you can populate a dashboard, you can set up alerts, that sort of thing. Uh, it's something we're exploring. Don't have any announcements I can make yet, but um, 
it is something that we do want to enable, right? Because we we absolutely see the value in being able to create sort of those custom dashboards and alerts. All right, let's uh, spend maybe five, 10 minutes on Q&A. I know we answered some questions while we're chatting, but um, Steve, anything else that is super sticking out in the chat that we want to answer here on, on well, the show? I'm getting a lot of good ideas here, Zach. Lots of good ideas here. The other, the, the one that sticks out is uh, getting user sentiment through this tool. Like, uh, you, you know, are you happy with your experience? Rate one through ten, taking user pulses uh, as a possible um, feature. That's a good feedback. Yeah, it, it, it's a good question, and, and it's it's something that we do have on um, on our backlog. I, it's. It's a little challenging in the sense that, you know, the sort of the I, I usually say it as a joke, but it's it's not a joke that the our primary goal with endpoint analytics is we have to make sure that, you know, in collecting all of this data about the end user experience, we are not degrading the end user experience. Right. And, and this is where I think a lot of third party tools tend to go a little too far. Right. Is if we if we look at the impact that the the tool or the agent has on the device well it's actually contributing to a lot of the end user experience problems and so we've we've been very intentional about making sure that um the the data that we collect is as small as possible and that we collect it at uh specific times of day and, and do the upload only when resources are available so we're very conscious about the impact we're having on end users and so it's it's something where we do want to be able to sort of, uh, you know, I mentioned some of the more subjective metrics. We want to be able to get proxies for those, but we also do want to be able to incorporate direct end user sentiment as well. It's just a matter of making sure that we can do it in, you know, sort of a quiet and non-intrusive way. If, if I'm already a Microsoft 365 E3 customer and I'm using all Windows 10 enterprise devices, uh, do I need any additional licensing for endpoint analytics? No, so if you're if you're an M365 E3 customer, you're good to go. The so endpoint analytics as a tool is included as part of your um, EMS license, your Config Man Intune license, and then uh, the the only exception to that is going to be the proactive remediations piece, which is going to require Windows E3 or higher. And so that's you know just sort of the complicated nuances of the different pieces of the tool. The simple way to put it, if you're M365 E3, you've got everything you need for the whole tool. I got a question from um, a Microsoft person, Matt too. Any plans to add info related to RAM config, average usage to endpoint analytics? I think I know I've heard that question before, but Zach, let you have it. Yeah, no, it's it's a great question, and I think it you know kind of goes back to the point we made uh, for application reliability, right? We we do want us to, to sort of bring some of those more subjective indicators of user experience into the tool, and so um, I don't have specific timelines that I can share, but we do uh, have plans to bring resource performance insights into different aspects of the tool, um, both in a sort of device metadata sort of way, right? So currently in startup mm -hmm. performance, we look at the hard disk drives versus solid state drives. We wanna be able to provide additional pieces of metadata to help you draw comparisons between populations, but also from a you know resource utilization perspective, right? So is there a particular application where every time I launch you know, Chrome, for instance, it's spiking my CPU, <laughs> that sort of thing, right? So, right. I had to use a fake example there, but but you know, um, the there's there's definitely more that we want to do in that space, and I think you know the possibilities are endless. Good. So let's take two more questions, and then we'll wrap up the show because again, I don't want to uh, you know, waddle in this mud and and uh, take up everybody's time because I, I I love these conversations. I like I hours conversations with customers about this. Um, one more question, so I'll pick one, and Steve, I'll let you pick one. There was one question about, will there ever be an option to scope specific group of devices with the EA data? I'm sure you yeah, get that one a bunch. You guys are gonna <laughs> get me in trouble with all these roadmap questions. Um, so the, it it is something we wanna do in terms of, you know, allowing you to filter and sort based on, you know, sort of arbitrary device properties or, or your AAD collect or AAD groups config man collections. Um, we do want to enable filtering. Um, 
it's it's actually a wildly challenging technical problem because the a lot of the insights that we show are, are based off of massive amounts of data that are you know sort of aggregates that are pre-computed and when we when we start working with arbitrary groups we, we can't really pre-compute data so something we want to do um, i don't have a timeline i can share and uh but you know definitely we hear the feedback we get the question a lot and it's you know certainly value in the in the you know in the ask there so we'll keep working on it yeah, it's a frequent ask. I know I get it a ton. I mean, I kind of give the exact same answer. Like, you know, it's something we want to do, but how we do it is very challenging because the amounts of data, various other things we ought to consider too. So, Steve, did you get one more, one more good question for Zach? Yeah. Uh, what about our desktop analytics customers, or more specifically, our co-managed customers who are trying to decide between desktop analytics? and endpoint analytics because they're looking for app compatibility reporting. Uh, should they go ahead with desktop analytics for their co-management environment or should they wait for this in endpoint analytics perhaps? So, so a couple good questions in there. Um, the, the first thing I would say is, you know, I, I know desktop analytics and endpoint analytics tend to kind of be conflated. And the reality is that they're completely different tools, right? And the I think that the answer to your question really depends on what the specific company is, is looking to, you know, gain insight into. Desktop analytics is going to be specifically focused on application compatibility in the context of a Windows update. So if you're if you're still on Windows 7, I hope not, but if you're still on Windows 7 and you're looking to move to Windows 10, desktop analytics is for you. If you're struggling with Windows 10 feature updates, keeping Windows 10 current and primarily specifically due to application compatibility, desktop analytics is your solution there. We'll, we'll dive deep into all your applications, including the custom ones. We'll make sure that there aren't any compatibility issues that need to be addressed, that sort of thing. If you're more focused on the end user experience and you, and you want to make sure that you're giving your end users the best experience possible, not necessarily in the context of a Windows upgrade, just you know, day to day, that's where endpoint analytics comes in. So the, the solutions certainly are complementary, right? So for, for large corporations that have application compatibility concerns, definitely encourage them to use desktop analytics in the context of their feature updates. And then for, for organizations which are focused on the end user experience, which spoiler alert should be everybody, that's where endpoint analytics comes in, right? And so you, you will see certain insights that sort of look like they overlap, Right, like for instance, the, the one that always gets called out is the application help, right? In, in desktop analytics, we show some crash rate comparisons from before and after Windows upgrades. Endpoint analytics were focused on the application reliability overall at any point in time. So that's sort of the, the primary difference there. Um, in terms of the question of, you know, should we wait for certain insights to, to appear in endpoint analytics? We don't necessarily have any plans to bring desktop analytics like features over to endpoint analytics, right? Desktop analytics is our solution for Windows updates. Now, if there are, you know, one thing that we do have conversations with customers about quite regularly, we often get the request for uh, desktop analytics for Intune only devices. I will spare Danny the trouble of having to hear me go over this explanation again as to why I don't think that request really makes a lot of sense. But um, we can we can table that for for next episode maybe. But um, we do love having the conversation with customers around you know if there are specific aspects of desktop analytics or specific pieces of the application compatibility question that you'd like to see more insights on for your Intune devices, let's have that conversation and then we can we can explore ways on our end of how we can incorporate those asks into endpoint analytics, into endpoint manager in general, or even into Windows Update for Business, right? Our goal is to bring you the insights in the most relevant place, not necessarily, you know, just because I own the endpoint analytics, not necessarily just shove everything into endpoint analytics, right? So happy to have those conversations, but, um, you know, in terms of the specific, do I do desktop analytics now? Do I wait for endpoint analytics? It depends on what you're looking to get out of it. Yep. All right, well, um, thanks again. I'm gonna start to wrap up. I wanna make sure that I share here are some links. Um, the PowerPoint that I showed has a bunch of good links. I'll make sure I post that on the blog that follows up the video. But um, hey, Zach, thanks a bunch. Uh, appreciate the time, the, the partnership, friendship, basically everything that I can 
tell you thank you for thank you so much. Um, same for you, Steve. You've been a great partner. You know, keep doing these sessions with me, embarrassing us, embarrassing ourselves on <laughs> TV. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Thanks but, so much for having me, guys. Um, I feel like I talked yeah. a lot today. So if, if you if you guys ever want to want a little break from having to talk for an hour, feel free to have me back. <laughs> we'll do that. We'll do it. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Y'all have a good day.